Hello everyone, my name is Anne Lord and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's AWRI webinar. Today's session will take a look at vineyard variability and terroir, making, a sen making sense of a sense of place. I'm lucky to have joining me Rob Bramley, a Senior Principal Research Scientist at the CSIRO and Site Leader for CSIRO at Wake Campus Adelaide. Rob has worked as a soil chemist on land use sustainability issues and since 1996 has had primary research focus on precision agriculture and the management of variability in agricultural production systems for economic and environmental benefits. Rob has been a pioneer in the development of precision, ag precision viticulture for wine grape production systems and is a great, it is a great pleasure to have him here today to present. For those in the audience, I'd like to invite you to join the conversation. To ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. A Q&A will be held following Rob's presentation. If you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those of you just joining us, welcome. The topic for today's webinar is vineyard variability and terroir, making sense of a sense of place. And I'll hand you over now to our speaker, Rob, Dr. Rob Bramley, to start the conversation. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, now I'm just sharing my screen and I'm hoping you can now see the first slide in the presentation. Okay, so uh, thanks for the opportunity of giving this talk. I guess I need to start with a bit of a disclaimer by saying that in fact it's almost identical to the one that I gave at the tech conference last year. So if anybody has uh, was it at that conference and uh, doesn't want to hear it all again I'll be won't be offended if you sign off although you might uh, manage to uh, get some nuances out of today's talk that maybe you didn't get last time around so uh, we'll see how we go so I guess uh, as most people would know there are a range of different definitions of terroir its literal translation from the French is simply soil but in a wine context, it, it generally means much more than that. And sometimes getting an English definition of what it does actually mean is difficult because there's no precise English translation of the meaning in terms of, of wine. And perhaps the, the, the best one, or at least the one that I prefer at any rate, I think is attributed, attributable to Jamie Good, but we'll stand corrected on that, where he used the phrase sense of place to convey what is meant by terroir and in essence what it really means is it's, it's the summation of the various biophysical and social conditions in which grapes are grown and wine is made that give that wine its unique flavor and aroma so those social uh, social factors at least in a European context can could be somewhat crudely characterized as folklore uh, regulation certainly through appellation systems is important and I think more recently it's been recognized that winemaking is a part of the those social factors in terms of particular approaches that different winemakers might have to, to, to producing wine. The bi biophysical factors uh, include things like climate, soil, geology, landscape, the variety and clone that's been applied and uh, I'm going to f particularly focus on soil and landscape in this talk, but uh, those other factors are all obviously of importance. And I guess one of the things that, that inspired the uh, 
the, the decision to put this talk together is that in many respects, the term terroir has been hijacked by marketers and wine writers, particularly marketers who frankly don't really seem to have thought very carefully about what it is they mean when they refer to terroir and really unraveling what they, what, what they might mean is, is really the purpose of this morning's presentation. And I'm structuring this talk around some words that appeared in Wine Australia's strategic plan, the 2015 to 2020 strategic plan, in which it was stated that in order to increase demand and the premium paid for all Australian wine, Wine Australia intended to focus its efforts on our very best wines, those fine wines of exceptional quality and finesse that reflect their provenance and terroir and will most quickly elevate the image and reputation of the wines we produce. Now I'd imagine that most of you in the audience could uh, uh, interpret that statement in a number of different ways but uh, whatever the interpretation the Wine Australia in that plan went on to to state that they intended to continually invest to better understand and express our unique terroirs. And so my question very simply is how might we better understand? And as I indicated before, I'm gonna focus particularly on soil and landscape and the importance of scale in thinking about those things, um, recognizing that other factors, particularly things like climate are also important. So let's start by uh, looking at the soils of McLaren Vale. And I, I do this purely as an example. There's no intention here to, to, to pick on or otherwise for some obscure reason focus on McLaren Vale. I use it simply as an example of a wine region. And this map shows the uh, results of a very concerted mapping effort conducted by the South Australian State Government, the Soil and Land Mapping Program over about the last 30 years. It's unfortunately no longer going, um, but basically what that program did was to generate soil maps at a scale of one to 50,000 over the agricultural producing areas of South Australia. And I think at a slightly broader scale over the, uh, the rangeland areas. And in the course of that activity, they characterized 28,000 soil prof profiles statewide. They identified 15,000 soil landscape units, so called 61 subgroup soils, which most people would refer to as soil types and 15 soil groups. And in this uh, slide here, we see the soil groups that are identifiable in the McLaren Vale GI, which is 431 square kilometers, by the way, I should say in this map. And you might notice that I think 13 out of the 15 soil groups that were identified in the entire state occur in the McLaren Vale GI. So straight off the top, we can say that soil variation in McLaren Vale is fair, fairly substantial. And if you're interested in having a look at this map in more detail, go and uh, do a Google search on Nature Maps, which is a state government uh, website. And if you then click on this little uh, layers button highlighted in the pink circle, you can then play around and look at both soil variation and variation in a number of other things. Um, the soil map, this, this is the same soil map as the one I, I just showed before, it's 1 to 50,000. I'm not entirely sure of the scale of some of the attributes, but you can do some uh, recreational GISing if you wish. So we'll go back to this version of the map. And uh, we, through, through, the ac through access to uh, um, some data collected by the former Flocks Reboard, now Vine Health Australia, over this map we can impose the vineyard area, which is 75 square kilometres under Vine within that McLaren Vale GI. And in particular, I'm going to focus on this little pink rectangle here, which just so happens to be 5.2 square kilometres in area. Uh, that's purely an accident as it is its location. I just drew this rectangle on an area in McLaren Vale in order to highlight the soil variation that we see. And so now if we zoom into that, that 5.2 square kilometer area, you can see it displayed there. It's important to recognize that even though I've zoomed in, this is still a one to 50,000 soil survey. And uh, within that area, 
there are six of the uh, of the soil landscape units visible now and if we uh, focus in on what most people would call soil types we end up with just a little separation of, of the uh, this area around around here if i go back to the previous slide so we've got sands over clay soils this pale yellow area and if we focus just on soil types there's then an, a, an additional discrimination in this dark gray now That'll, that's all good. That's that's very good soil information. It's it's the best available in Australia as far as reconnaissance soil survey is concerned. But you'll notice that uh, a number of the vineyards have more than one soil type in them. Some have two or three. Um, but that said, it's important to recognise that soil mapping is quite a fuzzy activity. So if we look, for example, at this pink area here, the area of hard red brown texture contrast soils that have an alkaline, alkaline subsoil, in actual fact, within the, that area that's mapped as that pink classification, there are actually four different soils that might well occur. And you can see from this box that I've put up here that there are different probabilities of those various soils. So even though this pink area is mapped as the D3 soil, there's actually only a 35% chance that, that in that area it is indeed D3. Now these D3 soils, it just so happens, are formed from fine textured alluvium. But the G4 soils, which are also in this group, of which there's a 30% chance uh, of them occurring in these pink areas, they're derived from the so-called Blanchetown clay. And so those two different soils can be expected to have very different soil hydraulic properties and plant water availability. And so one might expect that the, ex that the expression of the soil component of terroir to be quite different between those two soils, which nonetheless are, are mapped in the same class in this one to 50,000 soil map. And much the same thing can be said about all the other different soil types. So for instance, this pale green one here, it's classified as, as deep uniform gradational soils dominated by this M2 soil type, which is a friable gradational clay loam. There's a 45% chance that that's the soil that occurs. But you could also, in that same area, have a, lo a loam over brown or dark clay with a 20% chance of that soil occurring. And again, there would be expected to be marked differences in the expression of terroir between those soils. And uh, the same sort of probability type approach and, and to some extent contrasting soils for each of those mapping units uh, occurs. So what can we say about the soils of McLaren Vale? based just on a brief look at that 5.2 square kilometres. Well, quite clearly, even when mapped at 1 to 50,000, which as I said before, is really very good for reconnaissance soil survey, the McLaren Vale soils are clearly markedly variable and with complex patterns of variation. As I mentioned, some vineyards are seemingly underlain by a single soil type and others may contain two or three often quite contrasting soil types. So quite clearly there's a mismatch between the scale at which this very good soil survey information is available and the scale at which it might be used to make management decisions, for instance, or indeed to talk about something like, like terroir. And that mismatch in my mind raises some important questions as to whether or how a vineyard might be deemed reflective of the regional terroir, certainly in the context of its soils. And there was some very nice work done in New Zealand a few years ago by Alan Palmer and colleagues at Massey University, which showed that if you need soil information like this to be at a scale that's consistent with the scale at which vineyard management decisions might be made, it would need to be at about a 1 to 10,000, 1 to 5,000 or even better. So in other words, 25 to 100 times as intensive as the existing data that we have available. And so that obviously adds to the soil complex complexity. And for this reason, I think that we can say that regional differences in terroir are highly unlikely to be driven by soil differences, and they're much more likely to be driven by 
uh, more macro scale things like climate, for instance, and there's been plenty of work done by people like Peter Dry and Richard Smart and John Gladstone's and others, which would lend weight to that argument in suggesting that regional differences are probably predominantly climate driven. So what do we actually know about the importance of specific soil properties to terroir? Well, unfortunately, out, the answer to that question is not much. And I would suggest that in, an, in Australia, it's even less than not much. M the reason for that is that most of the research which has looked at the question of what does soil uh, contribute to terroir, <coughs> excuse me, was conducted in non-irrigated European vineyards, particularly in France, but not, not, not exclusively so. And it was based on fairly small numbers of samples that were collected within regions or perhaps within sub-regions and therefore quite widely dispersed. And as a consequence of which the ability to to define the, the important soil properties which might impact on wine composition, for instance, is, is questionable in my view. And given the focus on non-irrigated situations, it's hardly surprising that soil hydraulic properties and things like plant water stress were highlighted in some of the classical texts as being the dominant factors that impact on the expression of the soil component of terroir. Unfortunately, pretty much everything else was seemingly dismissed as unimportant, almost certainly as a consequence of the way in which those surveys of soil, soil samples and wine relations were conducted. Indeed, some papers even uh, uh, go so far as to say that things like soil fertility or soil chem chemistry are indeed unimportant when, in my view, the investigation of those things was at best cursory. The other thing that's important to recognise is that Australia has some of the world's oldest and most weather weathered soils and many of our soils are inherently nutrient depleted, especially in places like Western Australia. And many of them have a strong texture contrast due to the process of, of clay alluviation, which results in clay particles moving down the soil profile over geological time. And in Europe and other places where the soils are much younger, that time hasn't been sufficient for that sort of texture contrast to have developed. And so really using, relying on uh, European work to say something about the importance of soil properties to Australian terroir is probably drawing a really, really rather a long bow. So I think there are some key questions that we need to be asking if we want to focus on terroir in Australia, particularly from the point of view of, of soil variation. And these include questions like, does variation in specific soil properties, including those associated with fertility, nutrient availability and microbiology, have a functional impact on grape and wine composition? If they do, at what scale are these effects expressed? Is it between region, within region, or within vineyard? And with, with respect to which aspects of grape and wine composition are these effects expressed? How do they interact with climate? And are they consistent over time? Which in the case of soil microbiology is a particularly important question because Whereas things like soil structure and texture don't really change very much, soil microbiological uh, composition can be quite dynamic and change quite markedly over the course of a season. And there's another question that I think is particularly important, and that is, are these various effects consistent across different varieties? And uh, those of you from Australia would be well aware that in some regions, and most notably to my mind, McLaren Vale and, and Barossa, there are projects being run by the local industry associations that seek to see whether or not there's merit in some sort of sub regionalization So instead of talking, for example, about McLaren Vale, can we identify sub-regions within McLaren Vale for which there are discernible differences in those sub-regions in terms of the, the wines produced in them? And uh, by coincidence, both of those McLaren Vale and Barossa projects focus on Shiraz. But my question is that if you can identify sub-regions with respect to Shiraz, can you also 
discriminate subregions with respect to other varieties, for example, Grenache or Cabernet Sauvignon or Chardonnay or whatever they might be. And are the, if you can do that, are, is that sub-regionalization consistent across those different varieties? If it is, then that strikes me as pretty helpful in terms of understanding terroir and, and pursuing the whole uh, question of sub-regionalization. But if, for instance, the sub-regionalization with respect to Chardonnay is quite different to Shiraz, then I would seriously question the value of pursuing that sub-regionalization, even to the extent that it might or might not have value from a marketing perspective, because clearly from the point of view of the biophysical impact on different wines, if there isn't consistency, then, then I think that to make something that's already complicated far more complicated and arguably of little value of pursuing. One other thing to say, by the way, about projects like Barossa Grounds and, and the McLaren Vale Initiative is that the data and information collected during the, the conduct of those projects could be really valuable in understanding the differences between McLaren Vale and Barossa, for example. But, Thus far, there hasn't been an attempt, to my knowledge, to, to pursue understanding of those between regional differences. Nonetheless, focusing on the within region thing, I think that uh, really the opportunity is to, to change scales a bit if we really want to understand what's going on. So in this slide here, there's some information that we collected over a number of seasons up at Deakin Estate near Mildura. And what we've got in this map in this series of maps on the bottom here is a high resolution soil survey collected using a thing called an EM38 soil sensor which basically measures the bulk electrical conductivity in the soil and then these other maps the PCD and yield relate to either imagery in the case of PCD so this is remotely sensed imagery of fine vigor or yield maps derived from having a yield monitor fitted to the, har the harvester at at Vintage. And this top map is the result of using a, a statistical algorithm called k-means clustering to cluster all the other different maps, the, the yield imagery and soil map, into some zones of characteristic performance. And we've also obviously got an elevation model here over which all these data have been draped. And basically the message that comes out of this top map is that you can quite clearly identify two zones within this vineyard, which is about eight hectares. And these two zones are quite different in terms of their inherent yield, uh, vigor and soil characteristics. And these little uh, rectangles here are some areas within this vineyard where we went and sampled just about everything you can think of, including grapes from which small lot wines were made. And we analyzed basically everything in the, the that you can think of. And, and indeed in a subsequent project, there were some commercial scale wines also produced from these zones. And basically out of that study, what emerged was in that vineyard, which is under uniform management, those zones that were identified on the basis of differences in soils, vine vigor and yield, produced wines with quite markedly different chemical and sensory characteristics. There was sensory analysis done which identified significant differences between those zoned as derived wines for a number of aroma and flavor attributes. Paul Boss, who was part of the, the, the team working on this project, analyzed the volatile compounds in the headspaces of wines produced from the two zones. And there were significantly different concentrations for 50, in 56 of those different volatile compounds. And in summary, the low zone wines had higher concentrations of many of those comp uh, compounds, which led to more fruit driven sensory descriptors compared to uh, the greener and more meaty descriptors used in the high zone wines. And we attempted to derive some relationships between on the one hand, the sensory and chemical attributes and on the other hand the soil grape vine attributes that we measured and there was some indication that soil iron manganese and berry phenolics predominated amongst some soil and grape factors and these tended to be associated with red confection and fresh berry 
and uh, some chemical properties amongst the, semi, sem, the chemical and sensory attributes. But the bottom line was that this study demonstrated very clearly that terroir was varying at the within vineyard scale. And uh, one would hope that there was an opportunity at some point to do further detailed studies like this to really get on top of understanding of the interaction between those soil and, and wine, grape and wine compositional attributes. Here's another example, a more recent one of, of within vineyard terroir variation. And this relates to some work that we did recently at Mount Langy Garan relating to variation in rotundone, which is the compound found in cool, cool climate Shiraz wines that, that results in those wines having a somewhat peppery characteristic. Now again, in this stack of maps, we've got a high resolution soil survey. We've obviously got an elevation model from which we've derived a map of slope and also of aspect, this one up here. And then these three purple maps in the middle are maps of the rotundone concentration derived from a fairly intensive sampling of fruit throughout that vineyard. It's 6.1 hectares, this vineyard. And then on the top again, we've got a clustering of, of those different maps. Now you might notice that across the three years that, for which we have rotundone maps, the rotundone concentration varies might quite markedly, but the patterns of variation in any of those years is fairly stable. So if we look at it in two dimensions, so here are the maps for 2013 when the mean rotundone concentration was around 400 nanograms per kilogram. In vintage 2013 when it was only about 10, so about a 40 fold difference. And then in 2015 when the concentration was around about 31, but probably in 2015 much closer to somewhere in the midpoint between the other years because this 2015 map relied on much earlier sampling and we know that rotundo tends to form very late in the season. But hopefully everybody can see that the patterns of variation in those, those maps across the three vintages is really very, very similar. And so in this bottom left hand map here, what we've done is clustered those three rotundone seasonal maps together to identify in this case two zones of, rotund of characteristic rotundone variation and in this map in the middle bottom three zones. And then over on the right hand side here, we've incorporated into the clustering the, at, the vineyard attributes. So the, the soil electrical conductivity here, the slope and the degrees from north, the aspect. And the important thing is that both, both of these, the three cluster rotundone only and the more holistic incorporating other things map, both of those uh, have a pattern of variation that the vineyard manager instantly recognized in terms of his own understanding of the vineyard when we showed him the results of this analysis. And so, as I say, when you go back to looking at it uh, in terms of this stack and in particular looking at this uh, uh, top map here, which is the clustering, the, the areas of this vineyard where the rotundo and concentration is highest, tend to be those areas that are orientated furthest away from north. And so there's some suggestion that maybe uh, solar, the incident solar radiation and or temperature are in, impacting on the accumulation of this compound. Um, there's also uh, uh, some suggestion that there is a soil effect. So where this ECA is highest tends to be the areas where the rotundo concentration is least. And so you can imagine that with understanding of, of this, uh, this particular aspect of terroir, there are opportunities to pursue uh, strategies such as selective harvesting. In a low rotundo season, there's probably not much the, uh, the winemaker can do in terms of trying to select out pepperiness. In a high rotundo year, selective harvesting followed by careful blending in the winery could allow there to be some degree of control over the pepperiness of final wines. And in a medium rotundo year, there's a real opportunity to try and keep the, the lower and higher pepper areas separate and stream them into different products to achieve a particular preferred wine style. Now you'll notice that in this map, in contrast to that Deakin Estate example, there's no yield or 
particularly vine vigor information. In fact, in this particular example, there was no association between variation in vine vigor and variation in rotundine concentration. And here's another example of where that was the case, in this case from the lane, uh, one of the lane vineyards in the Adelaide Hills, where on the left-hand side, we've got a map of vine vigor derived from imagery, and here a map of rotundone collected from last, last vintage. And you can see that the patterns of variation in those two maps is really not in any way similar. So again, clearly some, un, some indication of terroir varying at the within vineyard scale. What about at the within property scale? This is a photo of part of a vineyard in the Eden Valley. In fact, there's almost 100 metres elevation from the top of this hill to, it, to the bottom of it, which is hidden by these vines down at the bottom. And it would be surprising if there wasn't some variation in terroir between the top and the bottom of the slope. And in fact, uh, we invest in investigated that. So here on in, the, in this top, that, that slope is running up and down this line here that I'm just pointing to. And the, there's, again, we've derived an elevation model of this property. And this, by the way, is about 62 hectares altogether, of which about 39 were under vine. So when you take out the headlands and so on, there were, there were uh, whatever it is, approximately 20 hectares that weren't under vine in, in this map area. And it so happens that this area is pr was planted when we did this work to three varieties, either Shiraz on this uh, eastern facing slope, um, Gewurztramina in here, and this area here, which was about uh, 20 or 30 hectares from memory, was all planted to Riesling. Now, if you could imagine that all of this area was, was replanted uh, to Riesling um, by in, in inputting this elevation data along with some uh, local weather information, by inputting that into a model called SRAD, we can model the season degree days. And so if we just look at this uh, area that's planted to Shiraz here, in fact, the variation in season degree days between the top and the bottom of the slope amounts to around about a six day difference in likely harvest date if you wanted to harvest the entire area, entire area at the same uh, level of ripeness measured by bricks. If instead of the variety mix we had, as I said, planted the whole thing to Riesling, there would be an 11 day difference from the top of this hill here down to the southeast corner um, down here where the season degree days are greatest. So clearly in the context of topographic variation and its impact on, uh, on thermal time, there is marked variation in terroir at the within property, uh, within property scale. And within the area of this vineyard that was planted to Riesling at the time that we did this study, uh, there were in, in, in any given year between three and five different Riesling products produced. And in the years when there were three, those retailed typically at between 18 and $35 per hectare. Two of those products were simply price variants of a similar style. And the third was made to a quite different style. And so again, you could probably ask the question as to which of those three wines was most reflective of the Eden Valley terroir. I think that's probably a matter for some debate. And, uh, and again, raises questions of, of the merits of talking about a regional terroir as opposed to trying to understand that terroir at the within vineyard scale. Now I want to come back to this McLaren Vale example and say something about single vineyard wines because you will have noticed when we were looking at this soil map earlier that there is marked soil variation across, across the various vineyard boundaries. Those vineyard boundaries and the vineyard orientation is predominantly approximately north, south, east, west. And I would argue that most of those vineyard boundaries are accidents of fate in that they don't really bear any re relation to uh, the, the underlying biophysical variation. Now, somebody pointed out to me when I made that statement in the past that in fact, of course, all the boundary positions are the result of design. And that's quite true, but that design is constrained by things like the availability of land, whether or not there are roads there, 
the availability of planting material and so on. And in fact, when you look at this area in a Google Earth image, you can see that, for instance, down here, there's a road running at a diagonal, so not north, south, east, west, which means that this boundary here has a diagonal. There are other ones like down through here, which I presume is a creek line, uh, where that's imposed, uh, an uh, had an impact on the boundaries. But with those few exceptions, the boundaries of these various vineyards has nothing whatsoever to do with the biophysical variation. And so against that background, I would question what's so special about single vineyard wines. And the idea that a single vineyard wine is somehow particularly reflective of its regional terroir is something that I would think is pretty hard to argue given the underlying va variation in soils, for example, which we've talked about earlier. So as we've seen, vineyards can be highly variable. Uh, the soil variation in, within them may be marked and that variation almost certainly has no bearing to the boundaries which confine that vineyard. And if we come back to this rotunda an example from Mount Lange, I should say that the fruit that, that's grown in this vineyard goes into a single vineyard wine, but in fact only about two thirds of that fruit goes into that single vineyard wine. So if we wanted to be really pedantic, we could say that in fact, it's not a single vineyard wine at all. It's a two thirds of a single vineyard wine. Now I suspect that neither the consumers nor the marketers are too bothered about that uh, uh, element of pedantry, but nonetheless, again, it raises questions about uh, the, the merits of thinking about single vineyard wines. I should have said also earlier, by the way, that the wine, that, that that comes out of this vineyard at current vintage sells for about $120 a bottle, whereas the fruit that doesn't go into that product uh, goes into a product that sells for about $30 a bottle. So you could argue that knowing something about terroir in this particular vineyard is worth of the order of $90 a bottle. So clearly quite a lot of money to be made out of having a good understanding at the within vineyard scale of terroir and, and vine and wine variation. So the take home messages out of all of that, well clearly terroir is real. Uh, there have been some commentators including Mark Matthews from UC Davis who wrote a, a book about the mythology of terroir last year, uh, calling into question the extent to which terroir is real. There's no doubt in my mind that terroir is absolutely real, but we spend far too much time talking about it at completely inappropriate scales. Most people focus on between and within region differences, and those between region differences are almost certainly overwhelmingly climate driven, with other factors in my view of probably relatively minor importance. Within region differences, if indeed they exist, are likely to be driven by an array of biophysical factors. And I think attributing those differences to just one or two, whether it be soil or geology or something else, is really pretty misguided without some scale appropriate information and also a robust demonstration of cause and effect. On the other hand, if we analyze within vineyard variation, I think that offers a lot of hope for a much more understand, much more robust understanding of terroir. And as we've seen, such understanding might also be highly profitable. So it's really a, an understanding that's worth pursuing. I think if we're going to place focus in Australia on terroir and in making something of terroir in, in making and marketing our wines, then it really ought to be incumbent on us to make sure that we know what we're talking about. And with respect to soil and the impact of soil properties on wine com composition, I don't think we really do know what we're talking about at the moment. Uh, and finally, as I, as I was just saying before, in regard to single vineyard wines, I think the virtue of those single vineyard wines almost certainly has nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that they derive from single vineyards, at least in the context of their variation and the fact that most block boundaries be, bear no relation to biophysical variation. We know that all vineyards are variable, I can very confidently say that. And the other thing to point out is that multi-region and multi-vineyard wines may be just as virtuous as a single vineyard wine. If anybody's got any doubt about that, I suggest they go and have a discussion with somebody like Peter Gago, who makes some rather well-noted uh, 
multi-region, multi-vineyard wines. And so returning to some comments made in, in the Wine Australia strategic plan, there was some commentary from Brian Walsh on the uniqueness of Australian wines when he said that our natural endowment of diverse, unique and superior terroirs combined with our skilled and innovative people means that we have the capacity to be recognised here in Australia as making some of the best wines in the world. Now, I would suggest that rather than relying on stories that are conjured up by wine writers and marketers to evoke our sense of place, it might be to our greater overall advantage to better understand our terroir and therefore ensure that claims that we make about it are founded on robust science and understanding. And I think such science might make a major contribution both to the desirability of our wines and also to the skill used in producing them, and that it might be that for those reasons that our wines may be recognised as the best in the world. And just finally, uh, some of you will have seen this photo before, I've shown it many times now. I took it uh, whilst doing some sugarcane work up near Bundaberg, it's a church not far outside of Bundaberg, where in their wisdom they put up a sign saying a GPS will never find heaven for you. Now, I think that for a whole range of reasons, it's pretty difficult to uh, disagree with the sentiments expressed in that sign. I, I can tell you that since I took this photo, the church has closed down and you can draw your own con conclusions as to why that might be. And certainly whilst a GPS mine might never find heaven for you, I've got no doubt that it might well help you to much better understand uh, your terroir and as a consequence of that, hopefully to produce a more heavenly wine. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll acknowledge the, the many people who've made input to, uh, to the various uh, components of the story, uh, as told just now, both from the point of view of doing the work and also contribute to its funding. So thanks very much. I'll be happy to uh, try and address any questions. Thanks, Rob. Um, Rob's only got a few minutes to take some questions. So if you've got any questions, can you please click on the Q&A box and um, type your question in and we'll pass the question to Rob. So while we're waiting, I'll um, just let you know about our next about our next, um, aid, um, our next webinar on next week, which will be presented by the AWRI's Peter Godden. And the title of the webinar is Sooty Mould Red Wine Making Trial, its impact on processing, composition and sensory attributes of Australian wine, of Shiraz wine, sorry. Um, and if you would like to register for this, please visit the AWRI website. Now we're still waiting for some questions. So if you have got one, if you can uh, please send it in fairly quickly. Everybody seems to be satisfied. Yeah, well, we don't seem to be getting any questions, Rob, but was there anything you'd like to add to wrap up before we uh, end the broadcast? Uh, no, I think I've probably said uh, what needs to be said, but people might just be interested to know that further to uh, Wine Australia's interest in the whole issue of terroir, there is quite a large project now just getting underway, focused on the Barossa. Um, looking at Shiraz terroir and, and variation in Shiraz wines um, throughout the Barossa. Um, I have a small involvement in that, looking at some of these biophysical issues. Um, and I guess a, a case of watch this space because over time we'll hopefully uh, be able to develop a better understanding of terroir.
I see that there is a question yes, there is. In now from Colin Starkey who's asking me about single vineyard variation. Would this not also be reflective on management style? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you, Colin. I think it would do. Um, I think the, the, the comments that I made about single vineyard wines relate in particular to the notion that those single vineyards are particularly evocative of a regional terroir. I think it's quite common to read, particularly in the win weekend newspapers where wine writers and marketers have commented on particular wines as being evocative of their, ter of their regional terroir because they are single vineyard wines. And I think from the biophysical perspective, I just don't, don't agree with that. I think it's, it's nonsense. Um, and uh, I agree with you, Colin, that, that things like individual management issues will also impact on those single vineyard wines. Um, um, and also Ken Eckersley's yeah. offered. Ken suggested that the conclusions are in contradiction to the evidence I've presented. I'm not too sure on what basis you argue that, Ken. I think the point is that when you think about variation at regional scale, the scale is too coarse. When you look at it at within vineyard scale, you can certainly make some conclusions about what things are impacting on on uh, on a particular wine. But if you've produced your wine from multi vineyard or from even from within a vineyard where that vineyard is highly variable, it's a bit difficult to attribute its characteristics to specific elements of the biophysical conditions of the vineyard. So uh, I don't think the conclusions are in contradiction at all. In fact, I think they're absolutely consistent that if we want to understand terroir, we've got to, we've got to examine it at the within vineyard scale rather than looking at it at a regional scale. Well, thank you, Rob. I think we might wrap up the session now. So I'd like to extend a thank you to Rob for providing the content for what I hope has been a very informative session. I'd also like to thank the audience for participating in today's session. Attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. And the next AWRI webinar is next week on the 16th of November. And the topic is Sooty Mould Red Wine Making Trial, its impact on processing composition and sensory attributes of Shiraz wine, which will be presented by Peter Godden. If you would like to register for this session, please visit the AWRI website. And that's all we have for today. And thank you again for attending. And I look forward to seeing you again at the next AWRI webinar.